talking about today is pretty much um, how to begin working with GitHub Actions, how transitioning from what normally would be Jenkins or GitLab solutions onto the new platform. So today we're going to be talking about, first of all, what is GitHub Actions, a bit about runners and how they work, and then just talking about actual workflows, how to write them, and then a live demo at the end. So first of all, what is GitHub Actions? It's a pretty much a CI CD platform that's integrated into GitHub that it's so pretty much supposed to give the solution to build, test, and deploy our code. The good thing about it is that it pretty much lets end users and people that are not able to set up a whole Jenkins at home or set up a whole CI solution to do it inside their own repositories and not have to worry about external things such as servers and costs of sort. Now, when we talk about runners, they are separated into two groups. The first one is a, called a GitHub runner. It's hosted on GitHub itself. It's being worked on Azure servers that have pretty much a window for when you can use them. So they are pretty much coming with some pre-built tools such as Docker, for example, on Linux distros and Ubuntu, but not on Windows or Mac. So in case you do want to use those, you would need to know what type of prerequisites and dependencies you need to install depends on what you're testing and your code. The other one would be a self-hosted, which we pretty much can be any server, either on-prem or in the cloud in any of the providers, and pretty much gives us a control that we can set up whatever we want, any tool we want to keep in there, we can decide what we're going to have. Pretty much, it would be the same as what most of us know as just running a Jenkins image on Docker that we install everything inside and then we can use differences. Here we have an actual server we can use, an actual EC2 instance, for example, that we can connect to and debug as we go. Now, when we talk about workflows, we are going to look at the first example, which is this very basic pipeline, and we're going to see what everything coming into it is. So the first one is the name. The name you put at the top is not the name of the actual pipeline, but the name that you want people to see in GitHub itself. So when I call basic pipeline, that's what it's, people are going to see when they go into the UI. That's when we look up actions. That's what we're going to have there, just this basic pipeline that we're going to use. Now, for triggering, we use on for any trigger we want to run our action at. So I did on push to the branch main, any branch we can use. If we remove the branches, it would work on any push. And you can do it on anything, on push, on opening PRs, on pretty much anything that you can think of. Then we have our jobs. Pretty much inside our jobs is parallel to stages in Jenkins or any other platform you're aware of. The good thing about it is that you can decide where each job can run. So you can run different jobs on different machines, both self-hosted and GitHub hosted. Now. Here in this example, I said runs on Ubuntu latest. Ubuntu latest is any Ubuntu latest version that GitHub can offer me. As we go, we can set up labels for our runners, and then we can change on how we're triggering different jobs to different runners, and then we can play with it in our entire pipeline. Then following is steps. Steps is pretty much what are what is happening inside my job what is happening in there and what am I doing? So just for the sake of it, I said echo, who am I? Just to look for an example and showing that. After that, we are pretty much going into a container-based job. The difference is that instead of running the job on our host, on the machine itself, everything is running inside a container. So if we want to run unit tests or if we want to test our code and we install dependencies depending on a service or something like that, then we are able to control the environment we're running in 
through containers and we can actually do it for any container, not necessarily a public one, but also for obviously it's any images in our ECR or GCR or whatever, depending on the policies and the permissions you're giving the different runners. Now, going after this is actions. Those actions are packages that are being built by the community or by professional providers of sorts. So for example, that's what an action block would look like. So pretty much we set up a name for the step that we can see, and then we are using the uses. Uses is an example, it pretty much shows, bring me this action based on the repository or the branch or the tag. And then with is any additional parameters that we're setting in the action itself. So as we're setting up inputs, not just for flows, we can also set them for our actions, and then you can pretty much decide on different things. So just for the sake of showing what it would look like, this is a checkout action. Checkout is how we would, instead of doing git clone every time, it would actually do it for us and it has the dependency of ref. So by the ref, if you don't do it, it would just take main by default. If you do give it a ref, then you would change it. Now in the GitHub, environment, you do have different syntax and different things. So for example, github.ref would pass the parameter of which branch I'm trying to connect with in the remote. So if I push, for example, to a branch called CI, the parameter would give it would be CI as well. And then I would know I'm always getting the correct branch depends on what I want. Questions so far before we just go straight into showing how things work live. I got a, I got a little question. Yeah. Um, so each each uh, step, each job in the action or each uh, action itself can be on a different runner. How do you handle um, moving artifacts or, or items between uh, uh, each step? For example, if I do a build in a Maven container, and then I want to do some other packaging or editing in a different container or a different runner. Okay, so it really depends. I can give you an example from my client. We are building images on one runner, and then all of our unit tests are happening in a different one. So we do have, a, like, for example, a development tag that we're passing on, and then through that, we can pull the correct image. Now, if you're running on the same runner, obviously the artifacts are going to be kept as you go along to the next step or to the next job. But when you are passing between runners and you want to have different things happening in a runner, you need to make sure that those, th those artifacts you want to pass are going to be able to pass as well. So if it's Docker images, you would probably have to hold some sort of a registry in the middle in case it's on different runners, unless it's the same one, then you can just run it from lo locally from the host. So, so, really so if, I, if, I set, if I set one runner, that's Ubuntu latest for my whole workflow, then it, it will automatically maintain the files between um, actions and jobs? Okay, on self-hosted, it would, but on the GitHub ones, it doesn't, sadly, because GitHub pretty much brings you up the machine as you start and kills it after the job is done. So if we're using GitHub runners, it would not be able to maintain those, but running on a self-hosted, you will be able to maintain artifacts between the steps. Got it, so thanks. That's the main idea on why a lot of companies that are working with GitHub are using self-hosted for their own environments and what they want to do with it. In addition to security reasons and letting it be part of your AWS ecosystem. So if we are going to get out of this. Um, just just a question before that. Uh, mm -hmm. If you self-host and you want to keep artifacts between, uh, let's say, jobs or whatever, so you need to somehow save them in a location that is accessible to all of the jobs and all of the steps? Is that is that 
the way to do that? Um, so yeah, pretty much um, the environment, like GitHub itself knows how to main, as long as you're not doing a checkout, it doesn't erase any information from your repository that you made locally. So if you keep the artifact and then it's running on the same, if it's like keeping a binary of sort, for example, I would be able to access it as long as an, another checkout did not happen and did not erase the original what I had there before. But in case that I'm doing those, what I usually do um, mainly for the binaries themselves, I keep those in a step that I know, for example, my first job would be building them. But then I know that the following job is the only job that's going to be able to run. And this is where the idea of concurrency and where you use, as GitHub goes, he is concurrent by default. And you have to tell it how you order things and how they work. And we're going to see it in the later when we talk about using different flows as one CI. But the main idea is that you pretty much have to maintain it somewhere in the repository locally on this on the host and then hopefully if you don't do a checkout it will stay there and it will because any changes on a self-hosted are maintained as long as the repo did not was not replaced so you can keep them but it will be inside the repository itself if you want to keep them on the host as a for any other service or mainly most of the people use is Docker images and then it just maintains on the host itself by default. So it really depends on which type of artifact you want to keep. Um, I, I actually can, uh, can um, tell something from my client. Um, GitHub actually um, has a, an, an action. Um, I send it in the, in the chat. It's called um, upload artifact. So that way you can main, it basically upload artifacts to your repository and then pull them in other jobs or workflows. So uh, it's pretty nice. Where does it upload it to? The repository it, itself. The repositories or yeah. S3 buckets? You have a so section they're... dedicated to artifacts in the in the repository itself once you upload one and and then you just can pull it um, using the same method if you can also download plan, it uh, in the end of the job if you use github organizations you have like a separate amount of storage you can use if you use an enterprise plan you have like a bigger uh, amount of storage it depends on your github plan and to download it, you need to use download artifact action, and not the upload. So if you want, uh, yeah. To just... yeah. So pretty much all the things that your repository is doing with the runner are just through those actions that people built or someone else from a certain organization created to do that action for you. So a lot of like. Well, usually would do hard coded like different commands and stuff are now a bit more dynamic when you don't actually hold any of that code into your CI, but it happening outside of it. So that way you just pull it for usage when you need it. Now, for this first YAML, I created a very, like the basic, a very basic flow just for the sake of looking at different triggers and stuff we can do. The first one is workflow dispatch. Workflow dispatch pretty much means that you can trigger it manually. You can dispatch your workflow when you decide to. And then you can also give it inputs. I use just use the name user. I give a description, pretty much a name. And then it is required, which means if I try to run it without it, it will give me an error and will not run. It will just tell me, please enter. Please enter a value of sort, and the type is string. So types, you can put string, and then you have to type stuff in. You can have choice for drop-down menus, which we'll see later as well. So for this job, it's running, as I said, on a self-hosted, on a self-hosted, on a GitHub hosted, sorry. 
Ubuntu later. So it's going to use Ubuntu 22. And it's going to just run echo for any input we choose. So if we go here, I'm going to have the run workflow. As I said, if I try to run it without it, please fill out. It's not going to let me do it as unless. The good thing is, which the same as with Jenkins multi-branch, you can already choose which branch you want to run it from. So if you make changes in a different branch, you can actually choose to do those changes and run a different code from what you would normally have, which is really good for testing different flows and seeing if they are working as, you're, as they're supposed to. So if we put in the name Ben and we'll run it, also you have to refresh every time because for some reason it doesn't show it the first time you press it. If we go in, we'll see it starting. So he's pretty much requesting from GitHub uh, a runner that's named Ubuntu and that's named Ubuntu latest. So it's running Ubuntu 22. And if we go down, we see our action. If we do the here, what we see is actually the output. But if we press this drop down, we actually see what the actual command was and which shell you ran. So you can also run different shells. You can run Python shells, and you pretty much can write a whole script hard coded, or you can just activate different scripts from different locations in the repo. But the idea is you're not obligated to use a default shell like in any other. CI platform that I used before, for example, Jenkins, you pretty much use Groovy most of the time unless you specify otherwise. So it does have that a bit more dynamic feel and you can do more stuff with it. So if we go to the next one, it would be a container. So for the container, I'm using Python 3.9 Slim and I am using as well, again, the workflow dispatch with a different type of input called, called choice. So when I give it a choice, I have to pretty much specify what your choices are. And it is very, makes it very easy later because you can pretty much control your choices. You don't have any people telling you stuff that's not supposed to be there or using, most people use just strings from what I saw in different examples when I research this. So this is choice option is available on the GitHub itself. Most people don't are not aware about it for some reason. And it does give a quicker option when you run things. So if we go back to our actions and to our container. So I just created a small script that runs and solves uh, Sudoku boards of sort, but it's not the main thing here. So pretty much what I want to show is when we start on Ubuntu latest, we are coming, all of our servers have Docker installed as a service already. And then that's the step, the step we want to look at. So the initializing, initializing containers, it actually pulls the image and runs this very long Docker command that we pretty much what we see here, it's pretty much mounting everything for us, and it pretty much uses entry point to take the whole repo, use the steps as you input them, and then it uses them as a script inside the container. What's cool about it is that you can pretty much know you're not going to have any errors with multiple installations of different packages or, st or stuff like that. And also, as in any container, you're not going to have anything left over. But the main thing about it is that anything you run in there is kept. All your outputs, everything you're going to be able to see, which is nice. And also, it stops the containers for us, kills them, pretty much gets rid of all of what you installed, and pretty much having a clean environment later on. Now. These are just simple flows with one or two jobs not really doing much. What happens when we want to talk about an actual functioning CI? And that's where you have two different people, like two different options. The first one would be just writing everything into one big flow, let it run in, in the way it's supposed to run. 
but then you just are stuck with one flow that does everything for you. Another option that GitHub allows is you can create all your different flows as separate, as small separate YAMLs. And then when you look at them, you use a different parameter. We use a trigger called workflow call. Workflow call, what it does is pretty much saying, whenever I'm being called, pull me over, let me work. So that way we can design our CI to work and how, how way we want it to be. And we can actually say, okay, my build goes here, or my testing goes here, but then, oh, if one step fails, I want to do something else. So it gives you the option to, instead of just having a very long file for everything, run smaller files to happen in many events. For example, in my client, what I do is in addition to my CI running unit tests on every PR as well, the unit test workflow is being called. That way we know that any code we're pushing went through testing, not just by CI, but also is available for us when we open the PR itself. So as well as anything, that's the what I found would be a bit easier to work with because of you can pretty much play with everything and you have one file just calling all the different jobs. And as I, as I said, my trigger here is on a push. And to call those actions, you actually have to use, use the same one, the same key as for an action uses. But then you have to specify the entire location of your YAML to make it work in addition to the branch or the tag you want to use. Now, the only problem I've seen with this is that sometimes if your naming is not 100% correct, for example, it doesn't recognize the difference between YAML and YAML without an A, or if you rename a repository, everything would break. So you do need to make sure you're using the exact path. All those workflows to, to make them work are stored under .github slash workflows. That's where they're being stored and that's how GitHub knows to trigger them whenever you are pushing or doing anything by the trigger you set them up for. So now let's do a little push. We'll give him, we'll trigger him and we'll see the, what's happening on its own. Right. So we go to actions and then we are looking for the name of the flow of the big flow that calls the smaller one. So we go to call say CI and then we just gonna tell him, hey, look, work for me. And we're pushing in. So now what we're going to see is that once the push is done and we refresh, we're going to have a new job running, which failed for some reason. Ta -ta -ta. Needs build. Try again. Okay, start a failure. So as you can see, for some reason, it's not valid. That's the only issue that sometimes, okay, there it is. Sometimes you're, if you miss one small, um, one squirrely bracket, it will cause a startup issue and then it runs. So the idea with, Pretty much what's happening here is that it's being separated into the flow, the name of the job you used, and the name of the job inside that flow. So for example, in build, we have build and the job build. In test, we have test run and test test and another two. 
But the idea is that if you want to look at a specific failed job in your entire CI, you can just drop down and you can look at a different job anytime you want to. And then you can pretty much go through everything and you can see how they go. Now for all of this flow, I created two runners in our account in AWS. And to configure, I'm not going to get into how we configure them and everything, but there is a small guide here once you pray on the new self-hosted. And then you just choose your distro and you can set everything up really quick. It does work very fast. One thing to note, uh, once you want to remove a runner, you have to use the config before you're removing the machine. Otherwise, you would have the machine name stuck here. You're going to have a runner that shows always as offline in this screen. So do make sure you're removing it properly and not just removing the machine with Terraform in case you put it up. And once you're done, so I for this one, I use a lot of different actions. And as you can see, I'm not actually using any AWS commands and I'm not passing anything except for example, my ENV, I'm passing the registries and the the regions and my default regions all through what I'm configuring with my AWS account. And that's passing on to the next to the next job and the next steps. And that way I can maintain everything. And you can actually take outputs from different flows and give them as environment variables. For example, registry, you have to log into ECR to get the registry, but it doesn't show you the actual registry. So how does it know? So for, for everything it has, we can actually just see what it does. So when inside the login to ECR, they tell you, we have this output which is called registry, you have to call it and that's how you're going to get it. So pretty much there's a lot of documentation for every action and you can know how it works and what it does for you. But the main thing here is, for example, I call this in a step. Now, how can you tell the step, this is a step I need to get an output from, how can I know what it is? So you can give it, I can give steps IDs as well. For example, log in ECR. And then I know that I have to set this output whenever I want to use it. So I can just say, for example, because it's in the same job, I can just use steps, the ID, outputs of that action, and the name of what I'm looking for. So in this action, it's called registry. So I can just look it up like this. But if I do want to pass it between jobs, I have to set up a job output, which would look the same. If I, for example, want to pass it on to the next job, I would write outputs. And then in outputs, I would write the name of the output I want to have. So for example, registry. And then I would have to give it the same value. So steps, uh, login ECR outputs registry. And now, if I go on a different job, I can call this output and it would be the exact same, but then you can use it between your different jobs. So you don't, you're not pretty much, you don't have to do logging to ECR every time you want to do builds. You can log in, you can get back to it later and you can use it again. The idea is that you can pretty much, you don't have to use things linearly. You can do like, for example, one job, log in, log in to ECR, one job that pretty much all it does is configures AWS for you, gives you your outputs. And if you need more stuff, you can just play with it. So the idea with creating your jobs here, you can pretty much work in any way you want it to be. And you can have a more dynamic environment and your CI doesn't have to be linear of we can call it linear, but it's really just go, you can choose how things go and you can play with it a bit more.
questions, which I'm sure someone has. No. Okay. The, um, yeah, so this would pretty much be it. It's a very, because it's a very, it's more like you have to play with it. You have to see how things fit for you because for anything, things would be different for any CI or for any deployment you want to use. For example, I mostly use it for serverless, not for any clusters. So half of this for like example, keeping artifacts, stuff like that. I myself don't use as much, but then there are those that use it to do anything. For example, you have actions to do whatever you want. But the question is how to bring those actions in. GitHub actually created this very big marketplace that you can go in onto. I didn't want to do the GitHub one. So GitHub Marketplace pretty much has all the actions for you. You can choose anything you want. And it also, they also have like what they call creating an action of your own, which is pretty much you, they show you, oh, this would be a nice action you can create. This is how you can create it. And you can set up anything. For example, let's say we want to talk about our the checkout, which is the action we we use mostly to check out our repo. And then you can see they're saying, okay, if you want to use it, this is how you would call it. This is the latest version we're using. And then it also gives us all the parameters that you want to use. They have a lot. You can pretty much do anything and they give you different scenarios for with different stuff you want to try, multiple repositories, pretty much anything. And it is, there is a lot to it, but the thing is, because it's very dynamic and you can play around with it, it does come very quick. It, it's not as hard as understanding Groovy, for example. It's YAML-based, it's something we see every day. It's very nice and it's very easy to use. That is it. I love the sirens. So nice to look at all your blank screens. <laughs> Great session, Tom. Very, very <laughs> informative. I uh, had I had a sneak peek before, and it it, uh, it didn't uh, disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask. Um... Any Jenkins users out there, uh, if you feel like there's a difference, if you think that, uh, is there a reason to use Jenkins in any situation after what we just saw? I was about to ask the same question, actually. So I can actually say I made the transition to GitHub Actions two months ago, and there's a lot to it. You can learn a lot from it. But it does take away the learning curve of how a CI should look, for, in my opinion. So it, it's not to replace Jenkins, but it does, once you understand the concepts, it does give you a much easier way to build very complex pipelines later on. So it really is depends. But I can tell you that we're transitioning all of our Jenkins pipelines onto GitHub Actions now. Like we're doing a big transition where I, the client I'm working with, and it's what's there to stay so far. Uh, we we use both Jenkins and GitHub Actions. Um, I don't think that GitHub Actions can replace Jenkins uh, because it is based on uh, YAML files, right? You can't put incredibly uh, complicated logic into YAML files. In Jenkins, you can do pretty much anything you want. It's basically groovy. You can, you can use anything you want. And the community is much bigger in Jenkins uh, for now. It might change in the, in the future. I look at it as, let's say, um, Jenkins is a tank, right? You can take down a, a wall with a tank, 
but probably a hammer would be better. So it, it really depends on what you're trying to, to do. I would say that it really depends, as Nathan, as Natania said, but a lot of the complex stuff that you can do in Jenkins hard coded can be entered as scripts, for example. And then you can take outputs from scripts and you can see how scripts affect and work inside your GitHub, let's say in the runner itself and how the flow is happening. So we transitioned mostly from doing everything hard coded onto everything is in scripts. And all this, those different scripts are part of your flow and they are working in the flow of it. So you can do very complex things in addition to it being in a YAML. So it's not, as I said before, it's not to replace Jenkins because with Groovy, you can do a lot more obviously than a YAML. But when we do work, in my experience, we use most, we do prefer having scripts running in there. So it does give a bit of an easier way around it, I would say. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty much correct, but um, there's some stuff you would much rather do in Jenkins than GitHub Actions because it can be it it can become very complicated to do certain things in GitHub Actions. Let's say um, take down a let's go back to to the the example I gave. Take down a whole house. A tank would do a better job than a hammer. Mm -hmm. I think that it would be interesting to see where things go, especially with Circle CI, GitLab CI, all of those are working in a YAML based and they are becoming more and more mainstream, I think, as things go on and we'll see where it goes from here, honestly.